Good morning, good morning, brothers and sisters here. Good morning, brothers and sisters online. The title for our sermon today is The God Who Learns. And we will now call on our dear brother, our leader, to give us the message. So, the God who learns, and uh, so thank you very much also for those songs, that one about, uh, not the last song, the one before, I haven't heard that before, it's very nice. What was it called again? Here I am Lord. Here I am Lord. Do you remember who, who was it who said, here I am Lord? It was, um, Moses. Moses, yeah. Samuel, yes. Because it, it, was, it was in the night, yes. as it was in the song there. It, Moses saw the burning bush during the day, whereas uh, Samuel was woken up by this voice call, and he ran to Eli and said, I'm here, and it happened three times. And then Eli said, next time, tell, when you hear being called, say, here I am, Lord. And then, of course, that was uh, Samuel's calling. Here I am, Lord. It reminded me of, uh, I had a similar experience myself. Let's see, when was this now about? I keep losing track of time. Um, the years go by. <laughs> anyway, something like uh, about 20 years or so. But maybe, anyway, something like 20 years ago. <clears throat> so before that, you know, been, uh, we'd been a missionary in Russia. Went to Russia with, uh, serving uh, as missionaries for seven years and writing textbooks for spiritual moral education for for young people in uh, schools in Russia and the former Soviet Union. But, you know, after being there for seven years, I felt it's time to come back to England. So I came back and I felt like my missionary days are over. So I trained to become a school teacher, went to teach uh, in secondary school, and thought that was it. Anyway, so, but I remember, uh, and I thought, well, okay, I'll spend the rest of my life just teaching, uh, being a school teacher, which I enjoy, as teaching religious education. And um, after being doing this for a few weeks, I thought I should have started doing this 20 years ago. Got a captive audience of young teenagers. I can talk to them about God, and I can get paid as well. <laughs> anyway, so uh, that's how I was going. And then one night, I was woken up, and uh, and then God said, "I miss you." And I thought, "Oh, well, that's nice. Nice to be missed by God." <clears throat> but then I said, why do you miss me? And he said, I miss you not teaching the principle. And I said, well, there's lots of other people teaching the principle. Why me? And then God said, because you teach it the way it's supposed to be taught. And then he said, I should go to America and teach. Anyway, so uh, I thought, well, this is interesting. What am I going to do with this? Am I just going to go back to sleep? Um, or do I need to take this seriously? And I thought, well, if I'm going to do this, where do I start? I hadn't, been, I hadn't taught the principle for at least 10 years before, you know, this point. After I went to America at the seminary, then I went to Russia for seven years. And so I hadn't taught any workshops for about 10 years. Anyway, <clears throat> so I thought, okay, this is a uh, calling. So I thought, okay, I'll go and sit in the back of Sunday school, the teenagers that Tim Hewish was teaching. Anyway, I just sat in the back and after a few weeks he said, why don't you come and give a talk? And so I started to get involved in teaching Sunday school, which I did for 10 years, every Sunday for 10 years as a teenager. Anyway, then I got, got involved with teaching other workshops for HARP and then with ESGD kindly inviting me to come and teach. And Anyway, it was just interesting, this kind of... So that, that song, anyway, reminded me of that experience that I had, Here I Am, Lord, and just having that kind of willingness to, to respond to God's calling. And sometimes I think, well, mm. problem is if you are, when I when I said to God, "Why do you miss me?" Then I realised then God was going to get God was going to tell me. <laughs> Whereas if I said, "Well, that's nice," God misses me, and then went back to sleep again. <laughs> anyway, so when God gives you a mission, it's you have to think, okay, how am I going to do this? Where where am I going to start? And so I started teaching Sunday school, and then I ended up teaching in Chongpyong for four years, and yeah. Anyway, so it was a nice song like that to adopt it. 
So the God who learns. <clears throat> so this is uh, Moses encountering God, interesting enough, at uh, the burning bush. <clears throat> and God gave Moses a mission. I will send you to Pharaoh. And Moses, who'd been, uh, was 80 years old by this stage, <clears throat> he said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? In other words, who am I? I'm just a shepherd. I'm nothing. Why is anybody going to pay any attention to me? So it's a really important question, who am I? Yeah. Do we really know who we are in front of God? Or do we just see ourselves from a particular point of view? So Moses at that point, he just saw himself as being a shepherd. Why would anybody pay any attention to him? Who am I? What authority do I have? Just walking around, going up to Pharaoh and you know, saying these things. Anyway, God said, I'll be with you. Of course, God is invisible, so nobody can see that anyway. But uh, just like it said in that last song, you know, uh, I will, what was the words? So I'm brain dead. God's spirit will speak in your heart. That's right, yeah. So that was what God felt, you know. When you open your mouth, then I'll be there with you. I will speak through you. But Moses said, well, they'll say, what is your name? Who are you? Who am I? And who are you? Who is God? What is God like? Very fundamental questions. And uh, God introduced himself. This is my name, Yahweh. <clears throat> and say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. The Lord's name is Yahweh. But then we think about Yahweh. I didn't actually put the translation in there. <clears throat> but there are different c concepts of uh, understanding God, different conceptions of God, Yahweh. <clears throat> and so normally when you read the Bible, you'll see it's translated as, I am who I am. Yeah, that's the usual translation. I am who I am. And so this is very much uh, influenced by uh, Greek philosophy and a Greek way of understanding God. And so the Greeks then, this is Aristotle and people like this, they thought, <coughs> they saw God as being itself, that God was timeless, immutable, in other words, God is not changing, God is unchangeable, <coughs> God is incorporeal, just pure spirit, unchanging, immutable, I've got the words in there twice, immutable, hmm. and the ground of all being. So you can see here, this is a very abstract idea of what God is like. It's a very philosophical idea of what God is like. It's why it's called the God of the philosophers. A very philosophical idea, God is the first cause, the unmoved mover. <coughs> and that also, as I said, this is uh, described as the God of the philosophers. And also has certain kind of social implications within uh, if everything's supposed to be unchanging. It also means the social hierarchy which exists should be unchanging and uh, inevitable. And the golden age then was always in the past, very much a backward looking kind of thing. And also very much connected to this is the idea of God is the first cause and everything that happens is caused by God. And so from this you get the idea of determinism or the future then is closed, the future is not open. <clears throat> Whereas though, if you read the, the rabbis, they don't translate the, Yahweh as I am who I am. But it's a very complicated language, Hebrew. So it's much more like this. I will be what I, I will be what, where, and how I will be. So in that sense, God I, is changing. God is completely free. It's a very different kind of concept. I will be what I, where and how I will be. In other words, I can choose how I want to be. In that sense, God is alive. God is a very much alive. And then here, instead of... <clears throat> A sort of abstract God, the God that created the universe, the first cause, the unmoved mover. The Hebrew, the biblical understanding of God, as we saw there, the way God introduced himself to Moses, he didn't say to Moses, I'm the creator of the universe. Yeah, I'm the first cause, I'm the unmoved mover. Yes, he didn't, he didn't introduce himself in that way. God introduced himself as a personal God, I'm the God of your father. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. In other words, God revealed himself as a personal God who knows people individually, by name. 
not the abstract force behind the universe, not this divine cosmic force, yeah? which is a bit like you find in Star Wars, may the force be with you. The biblical view of God is actually God is personal. God knows us by name, individually by name. And that's why God cares about us. So when God introduced himself to Moses, it was a, as a personal God. And then, anyway, we can see when you read the, the books of uh, Exodus and Deuteronomy and the other ones, that God had an incredibly personal relationship with Moses. He spoke to Moses face to face. He called Moses his friend. He revealed his heart to Moses in an incredible way, and, he arg and Moses argued with him. It's an incredibly intense personal relationship. There's no sense that God, that God was just an abstract force. Yeah. <clears throat> but also, very much the, the Lord of history. So God is involved in history. God is involved in our, in our lives not just an abstract God that just set off the big, caused the universe to come into existence and it's been running ever since in a deterministic way according to the laws of nature. But actually God is very much involved in history. And so that's why God said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now God intervened in history. God is working through history. That's why we have this sense of the providence, God's providence of restoration. God is actively involved in the historical process. God isn't an abstract kind of God. <clears throat> so here, the biblical view is we know God not through his essence, but through his acts. Yeah. And then the golden age then is very much in the future, not in the past. And that means the future then is open, the idea of freedom. So th these are two very different conceptions of God based upon a different way of translating uh, Yahweh. So as I said, traditionally Christians have always have adopted the left-hand view of what God is like. And so you can see this in, in a book, in uh, something called the Westminster Confession. Anybody come across this, the Westminster Confession? It's formulated in Westminster in London in the 17th century, around about the time of the Civil War, after that I think. And uh, sort of Christian divines from all over Britain, they gathered together to decide what it is that they believed. And they wrote down in great detail that, that, you know, that what they believed about God and about scripture and about all sorts of things. It's much more detailed than the Nicene Creed, for example. And it's still the basis then of the, of the beliefs of the Church of England um, and also of the Presbyterian Church and uh, very influential. Anyway. So it's interesting to see how, how God is described in the Westminster Confession, which is just a standard Christian way of understanding God. There's but one only living and true God, who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible without body, parts or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will, with his own glory. <clears throat> so it's interesting there, you can see it's very much, it's, can you see the word heart there? No. The idea of God is a God of heart is just absent from traditional Christian belief. You can't see the word love there either. It's all very much, it's incredibly abstract. God is without passion, God is without feeling, God is without emotion. But each one of these little statements here is supported by a Bible verse. So of course, you know, the Bible is a huge book and you can pick and choose which particular verses you want to put in and which ones you want to leave out. Okay, so I'm not saying that these ideas don't come from the Bible, it's just they've been very, I would say, very, very selective in the ones they chose, very much influenced by a Greek Aristotelian view of the nature of God. <coughs> So it's immutable, again, unchanging, again, that's, you know, God doesn't change. So if God doesn't change, it means God doesn't learn. Unrighteous will for his own glory. And so again, okay, so why does God do things here? God is doing things for his own glory. So why did God create? God created us to worship him for his glory. But if you said, well, why do you have children? Oh, I have children to serve me. If you, if, if, <laughs> you know what I mean? If you actually ask parents, 
Why did you have some children? Why did you have so many children? Well, I needed someone to go and do the gardening and, and put the rubbish out and serve me and do the this, this, and this and look after me when I get old. You think, hmm, not really a good motivational reason for becoming a parent. I want to ha have a parent who I want to have children so that they will worship me. I want to have children so they will go around praising me and say nice things about me. Yeah, that's not really the heart of why people become parents. So it's kind of an interesting if you think about it in those kind of terms. If, if, if you find a human being who is like that, you'll think actually that's a dysfunctional human being. <clears throat> Most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Forgiving in that so here it sort of becomes more rather more biblical. Most gracious, merciful, long suffering. So here's the idea God does suffer. Abundant in goodness and truth, and forgive iniquity, sins, transgressions. The reward of them that diligently seek him and and withal most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin and who by no means clear the guilty. And it carries on. God has all life, glory, goodness, and blessedness in and of himself. He alone is all sufficient in and of himself, nor does he need any of his creations or derive any glory from them. Rather, he manifests his own glory in, by, unto, and of them. He is the only source of all being by whom through... Anyway, it goes on like this. <clears throat> and so you can see here, it's very much an abstract idea of what God is like. So if we look at the Bible though, it's full of stories. This is full of abstract definitions. The Bible is full of stories. So it's interesting to see. So obviously we know God created human beings and God has certain kind of vision of how he wanted things to be. It didn't turn out like that. And the earth instead became a, one of a huge amount of crime. And um, so, Anyway, then it talks here about the flood, Noah and the flood, and the Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, that every inclination, the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he'd made human beings on the earth, and he was broken hearted. So here we've got this idea that God is intimately involved. God regretted something that he did. Does that fit together with this idea of of the Westminster Confession. You know, God regretted it. God wished maybe that he hadn't created human beings. So why was that? It's because, you know, he thought that his children would all have happy families and would live in peace with each other. But when he saw his children just hurting each other, he saw them with so much violence around, each person, each of his children who were suffering, he felt that suffering as his own suffering. It's like if you have children, you see your children suffering, you feel that suffering that they have as your own. And you cry when you see someone else suffering. And so when God thought, well, he wanted his children to be happy, but instead he just saw them suffering because they're getting hurt through this violence. And so he wished, he thought, well, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I shouldn't have created people and in that sense he regretted it. He made human beings and he was broken hearted. So right there at the very, very beginning of the Bible you get the sense God was broken hearted. God was, yeah, broken hearted. The essence of God is God is a being of heart. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race that I have created. And with them the animals, birds and creatures that move along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So it's very easy then. You know, so what's going on here? God is thinking, okay, I made a mistake. I regret creating human beings. I'm going to wipe them all out. It's very, it's very easy to think like that, isn't it? Oh, that's the enemy over there. Let's wipe them all out. Let's get rid of them all. And uh, except if Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord, he said, I'm going to wipe everybody else out and just start with Noah, start all over again. And it's very easy to think like that. Okay, I'm going to fire everybody, or I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, let's start all over again. So that's what God did. Anyway, this is the way it's interpreted, you know, the, the flood. God did that. Not because he's angry with people. 
God wasn't angry with human beings. It's, he was broken hearted because they were suffering. So it's not that God was angry. That's not the reason why the flood came about. And then after the flood, <clears throat> God said to Noah and his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you. <clears throat> I establish my covenant with you, and never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. So, why do you think God said that? Maybe he realized actually just getting rid of all these people wasn't the solution. He learned. Hmm? He learned. He learned. Maybe, and you can see that when we look at human history. You know, you can see people think, oh, if we just, uh, if we just got rid of this, I mean, this is the essence, really, of, of so many things that are going on in human history. If we could just get rid of that class of people, then the world, we can establish a good and just society. So this is the motivation of the communists. If we overthrow the ruling class and we kill the Tsar and his family, we kill all, the, all the, the aristocrats, we kill all these people, and then we can have a fresh start, a new beginning, <clears throat> and this new beginning can be the, based upon the proletariat who, because they've been so long suffering, are, are pure and uncorrupted. Anyway, we can see the result of that, that kind of approach. And you get the same. People think, oh, let's just overthrow this particular government and get rid of them all, and then everything can be solved. But, you know, God tried that, and it didn't work. And, you know, nowadays people realize, actually, it doesn't work. You know, we tried that in the 20th century. We tried that in France with the French Revolution. We tried that in, uh, in Russia with uh, the Russian Revolution. We tried that in Germany with uh, the rise of Nazism and fascism, getting rid of one lot and trying to... Okay, so anyway, so God learned. And so God said, I'm not going to do that again. It didn't work. So what does God do then? So later on, God calls Abraham, yeah? And God says to Abraham, walk before me and be blameless. Walk before me, be blameless. So God then is f following Abraham. And so we see <coughs> when the flood came and God's, God told Noah, there's going to be a flood, build the ark. Okay? Was there any discussion? Did God discuss his plans with Noah? When, when, Noah said this, when God said this to Noah, there's going to be a flood, everybody's going to get drowned except you and your family, did Noah protest? No. no. Did he say, well, that's not very fair, is it? You know, why just my family? Yeah? He didn't protest to God. He didn't discuss things with God. He didn't stand up and argue with God. And so God just went ahead with the flood. No. So he didn't... So it's interesting, though, when you come to... Abraham, we can see how God has decided to do things a little bit differently. <clears throat> so this is when God visits Abraham <clears throat> and has a meal with Abraham. And when the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. So these are some couple of the angels, uh, angels that came along, two angels that came along. And then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? That's different, isn't it? He just told Noah there's going to be a flood. But here God said, um, shall I discuss this with Abraham? Because Abraham's going to be the father of, mankind, or of all these nations. He's going to be this, this, and this. Maybe I should involve him in my plans. And so <clears throat> then the Lord said, the outcry against, said to Abraham, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grievous that I'll go down and see what, if, see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I'll know. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous of the wicked? It's a different kind of person, isn't he, to, to Noah. Will you sweep away the righteous of the wicked? Yeah. Is it, was, only, was only Noah's family the only righteous person, the only righteous family? Yeah. What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? 
Yeah. So God is so Abraham is standing up to God, he's arguing with God and saying to God, Should not the judge of all the world act with justice? I mean there's no nowhere else in the whole of religious literature will you find that apart from Moses standing up to God. Nowhere else in the whole of religious literature will you find someone standing up to God, a prophet standing up to God and saying, Look God, you are supposed to be the judge you need to judge with justice. It's not right that you're going to do this. And then Abraham then he engages in a long argument with God. He bargains with God. 50 righteous people, 45, 40, 30, works it all the way down to 10. Yeah, so God is saying, so what do you think God thinks about this person he's chosen, he's called, that's just stand up and argues with him? It's interesting, the kind of people that God calls after Noah, the kind of people that God calls, are all incredibly argumentative. Moses argued with God. Moses stood up to God. Moses challenged God yeah, and turned away God's wrath and God's anger. Yeah. So that's interesting that God is, in that sense, God is learning. He realized that the first time I did it, drowned everybody, that didn't work. Yeah. So I'm not going to try that trick again. It doesn't work. Yeah. So maybe I need to get much more involved, you know, you know, having these conversations with Abraham, explaining what I'm going to do to Abraham, outlining my plans, and discussing them, and be willing to change yeah, the plan, which was to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. So I found this kind of interesting to look at it this way, and to think, okay, uh, God is a God that learns. God is a God that changes. He's not immutable and unchanging and absolute in that sense. But actually God is very intimately involved. In the, the biblical understanding is that God is very intimately involved in human life. That God has incredibly deep feelings, brokenheartedness, joy, gladness, and uh, all these kind of emotions and feelings come out very, very strongly through the biblical understanding of God. And uh, it's just a shame, you know, that uh, Christianity, because of the way that Christianity developed, it became very much influenced by Greek philosophy, the philosophy of Aristotle, and the, uh, uh, and so you got this other aspect coming in. God is immutable. God is unchanging. You know, God is without emotion or passion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. God is just the abstract creator of the universe. Whereas uh, the biblical understanding is that God is always changing, interacting. If you have a conversation with someone, a proper conversation, do you leave that conversation the same as you were before you started it, or different? You must have learned Sorry? I said you must have learned something from it. Yeah, if you've had a proper conversation, you're, no, you're not the same after the conversation as you were before. This is one of the things with interfaith. I noticed, you know, when I was more involved with it. You know, sometimes people from different religions, they, they want to talk to each other, but they don't want to change their faith. But I always felt, well, when I have a, a proper conversation with a Jew or Christian or Muslim, I always, my view of life and, and God and spirituality changes. And I think that's the way it should be. You know, through these kind of conversations, one should be changed, one should be learning. Yeah, from every single person that one talks to. And I think, uh, I, mean, I think that's the way that God was. God was learning. And I think God was very, very happy to learn. And then we have to think, you know, do we learn? Or do we just you know, carry on repeating the same things we've always done? Or the same beliefs we've always had? And I often think, well, you know, when I look at my own life, what I believe today is very, very different to what I believed you know, when I first met the principal. I heard the principle, that hugely changed. I mean, I'm Jewish by birth, but Christian by upbringing, Church of England and all that. Uh, when I heard the principle, it completely transformed and changed my understanding of God and spiritual life and purpose of my life. But then over the last 45 years, that in itself has changed. I no longer believe what I believed when I first heard the principle. My understanding of the principle has changed hugely. The way I teach it has changed hugely. And, um, you know, I think you know, we should always be open to changing, to be reevaluating our faith and to be learning. And not to think, oh, having faith is just continuing to believe what I've always believed for 40 years. That's not faith. That's just, faith is about trust. It's about a relationship. It's about growing. 
Whereas if you just think, well, as it is with the sort of Westminster Confession or the Nicene Creed, <coughs> faith is just continuing to believe all these things, even if you can't understand them. And that's what, anyway, that's what made me very uncomfortable when I was a Christian. These are things you have to believe. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't believe, why should, why should I believe this? Well, that's, if you're a Christian, you have to believe this. You know, and you can just see it's all there in the Westminster Confession. But I thought, well, I don't believe that. You know, why should I believe it? I don't think it's true. It doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand it. And so, yeah, faith is m not about that. It's not about, oh, I continued, I still believe what I believe when I first heard the principle 40 or 50 years ago. <coughs> if that's the case, then we haven't really learned very much. Yeah, we're a spiritual community. We should be a learning community. We should be growing and developing and learning. And, you know, as, I mean, if you look at Father, you know, the providence is always going forwards. It's always developing. Father himself was always learning and developing and initiating new things as the providence unfolded and developed. He wasn't just continuing to do the same old thing that he'd always done. Yeah, I think he himself was always learning. <clears throat> I heard that when Father went to Egypt, when he was traveling around the world establishing the um, Holy Grounds in 1965, and he went to Egypt and he found out that Egyptian civilization was older than 6,000 years. And he thought, well, that's really interesting. I never realized that. Because being, being brought up in the Presbyterian Church as a fundamentalist Christian, he assumed that the Bible was literally true. Adam and Eve literally appeared 6,000 years ago. But then he realized, actually. And so far to himself, he changed his understanding about lots of things. And, oh, okay, maybe human beings appeared 10,000 years ago. And, you know, different times he said different kinds of things when he, when scientists understood and discovered more, then Father, of course, would change what he taught and what he believed so it conformed to reality. Whereas there are some people, you say, well, the Bible says the world was created 6,000 years ago, so despite all this other evidence, I'm not going, my faith is unchanging. I'm never going to change what I believe despite all these facts that appear. Yeah. Whereas actually we should always be changing our faith, you know, because it should be based upon truth, it should be based upon a deeper understanding, and we should be going deeper and deeper and deeper, and understanding more and more and more, which means of course that what we believe changes. It's no longer the same as what we, as Paul said, when I was a child, I thought like a child, yeah? Well, we need to, you know, put away childish things sometimes, and uh, grow in our faith, and uh, which of course means changing and learning and developing. So that's why we started off as a holy... I mean, you know, as you know, Father didn't want to start the Unification Church, but in the end it was, became necessary. It was the only way to go forward. Holy Spirit Association, the unification of world Christianity. But then, you know, <clears throat> changed, <clears throat> became the Family Federation. I mean, the reality is, in my opinion, even though, you know, they changed the name, what was went on on the inside continued to be the same. You know, we didn't actually genuinely go through a genuine transformation from being like a Christian church to being a family-based federation, just the families. We carried on more or less with the same culture and the same structures. And of course, True Mother now initiated the heaven, <coughs> Heavenly Parents community. Yeah. So again, that's different. So again, yeah, becoming much more inclusive in that sense and much broader, which of course means we need to change ourselves, we need to change our own self-understanding, who is God, who am I, these, all these things should be changing. So, you know, you can imagine Moses met God at the burning bush but 40 years later, do you think he was still the same person as he was when he met God at the burning bush? No. If you actually, you know, you read the conversations, you read, you see, even though he is 80 years old, the next 40 years, Moses went through incredible inner changes and transformations as he grew into, you know, his role as the leader of the Israelites and being a prophet and the arguments he had with God. You can really see, even though he's 80 years old, he was still growing and changing and learning.
And um, yeah, it's very easy, you know, when you get older and older, just to become stuck in one's ways and no longer wanting to change. And yeah, but actually, it's really important to 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 always be learning, to always be studying, and to be changing. Okay. Anyway, I heard Ron had a. You have something to share, so. I th- no, 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 no. The point I meant, I'm not going to talk for too long because uh, you have something substantial to share. So I'll so we'll stop now. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Do you, hey, please, yeah, ask me something. Uh, it's very interesting, but what, how, um, how did Abraham know that he can he can argue with God because before nobody tried that. That's right. What what happened? How did he maybe he understood God more, his nature? I mean what was the foundation he could suddenly argue with him? Good. that's a very good question. I think that's a sorry. I think that's just because that's, 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 that's right, as God calling that's, 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 <laughs> Okay, see what he has to say. <laughs> um, yeah, I, mean, I think that's the kind of person that he was. If you actually, <coughs> uh, did, did, do you know how Abraham discovered God? Have I, did I ever tell you that story in the Abraham and the idols? Yeah. Uh, you probably know that one from the Quran. No, yeah, no, I've read about it in the uh, Apocrypha. Apocrypha, yeah. Yes. That's very interesting. It's very interesting to, 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 to see, do you know the story of how Abraham discovered God? Okay, it's a lot of insight into his character. So you find this story partly in the Quran, but also in the Talmud, which is a, a Jewish um, commentary upon the Bible. It tells this story <coughs> of what kind of a person Abraham was. So Abraham, when he was a little boy, he was like all little children, he was always asking why, when, you know, why, 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 and, as you know, if you, if you answer a little child's, if you, if you answer the question, a child asks you, why does this? And then they say, why? And why? They're never satisfied that, you know, they always want to get to the really bottom of things. Anyway, when people grow up, they usually stop asking why and, you know, and that's the end of spiritual life. Anyway, so Abraham then, he was just always asking why. So one day he said to his parents, where do you, you know, one day he he realized that he existed. And he wondered, well, I didn't create myself, I wonder where I came from. So he went to his mum and dad and said, you know, where where did I come from? And then they explained to him the sort of biology of the birds and the bees, and he came out of his mother's womb and etc. And so he started bowing down and worshipping his parents. Wow, you created me. Anyway, so after a while, he said to his parents, well, where did you come from? And they said, well, we have parents as well. It's grandma and grandpa. And so he went, to found, you know, went next door to his grandparents and started worshipping them. And then he said to his grandma, grandma, you've got so many wrinkles. He had no manners, this boy. You've got so many wrinkles, you look like you've been alive forever. Is that true? And she said, no, no, of course not. You know, I, I had parents as well. So Abraham said, where are they? Well, they died, you know, they're out buried in the, in the graveyard. And so he went off to the graveyard and tracked down his gra- great-grandparents and then his great-great-grandparents and sort of tracked down his lineage. <clears throat> and he's tried to figure out where, what was the beginning, of, what was the origin of everything. And he started realizing it was the earth and the sun and the moon. And eventually he realized all this is changing and then he realized there's an unchanging, um, yeah, there's a you know <clears throat> cause, invisible cause uh, that was God, and he started worshiping God. <clears throat> and then um, anyway, so one day, anyway, his dad Terah, his job was an idol maker. He used to make idols, statues that people would bow down and worship. Anyway, so Abraham then he developed, he came to believe in the, in the invisible God who created the heavens and the earth. And then one day his dad, who was an idol maker, said to, to Abraham, look, Abraham, you know, tomorrow's market day. I can't go down to the market with you know, the idols. 
<coughs> that I've been making this month because I've got to go you know, somewhere else. Can you go down to the market and sell the idols? So Abraham you know, loaded up the, his car and drove down and put out the, you know, the tables and put all the idols, the little statues and the price tags and everything. And then an old lady came along and said to Abraham, Abraham, I want to buy one of your idols, one of your gods. Of course, they didn't think they were idols. They thought they were gods. I want to buy one of your gods. And Abraham said, what happened to your, the, the, the other gods you had? And the old lady said, look, somebody broke into my house and stole my gods. So I need new ones. And Abraham said, well, they weren't very powerful then if they could be stolen. <laughs> And she said, you're right, but you're such a handsome young man, I'm sure yours are much more powerful. And Abraham, as I said, he had no manners. He said, look, old woman, how old are you? And she said, I'm 80 years old. And he said, look, my dad made this in his workshop last month. He carved out this wooden one and he chiseled away this stone one last month. You're older than they are. They should be bowing down and worshipping you. And she thought, yeah, you're right, Abraham. And then she said, well, who do you worship then? And Abraham said, I worship the invisible God that created the heavens and the earth. And she said, okay, I'm going to worship him too. And so she became his first disciple. And the teachings of Abraham are what you find in Genesis. The creation of the world in seven days and the story of Adam and Eve. This is all Abraham's teaching, Cain and Abel, Noah. <coughs> and then, um, <clears throat> anyway, so the end of the day, Abraham went home. His dad said, how did you get on? Did you sell out? And Abraham said, no, I didn't sell anything. And his dad said, well, why not? Was there somebody there selling them for, for less than us? And Abraham said, no, look, look, this is what happened. This old lady came along and this is what she asked for. She wanted to buy one. This is what I said. And she didn't want to buy one anymore. <laughs> and that's how the whole day went. <laughs> and so Terry said, my God, what a stupid son I've got. <laughs> No way are you going to, to the market again. Anyway, so next month came round and market day came and <coughs> uh, Tara said, look, I'm going to the market. You stay at home and you look after the gods in the temple. And so Abraham said, all right, dad, I'll do that. So Abraham went into the temple and he went up to the largest god, this big you know, stone statue. And he said to the god, look, I'll be your prophet. You tell me what to say and I'll go round the world with your message. And the stone idol God said nothing. And Abraham said, well, mm, I wonder, did mum and dad feed you today? So they went next door, made a nice, you know, bacon and eggs and <coughs> everything, breakfast, and brought it and set it in front of the gods and, uh, you know, said, well, eat up. And I'll come back in an hour and we can discuss things after you've had a nice breakfast. Anyway, it's an hour later, Abraham went back into the temple to see the gods. And the food had been untouched. And so Abraham went up to the largest god and said, You're not a god. You have no speech. You have no spirit. You have no power. You're just a piece of stone that my dad carved. And all the rest of you little ones, you have no power. You're not gods either. So he went into his, into his dad's workshop, got a sledgehammer, and he went and smashed them all. all the little, he smashed all the little ones. Then he put the sledgehammer in the hands of the biggest god and went out. Anyway, at the end of the day, Terah had, been, had a really good day. He'd sold all the gods, sold all the idols, and he came in to offer all his, you know, the money to, to, to the gods in the temple. And he went in there and he found all the small gods had all been smashed. And he said to Abraham, Abraham, what happened? I told you to stay here and look after things. What happened? And Abraham said, look, God, look, Dad, I did. I went in to see them and pay my respects. And the big God, he said, you hadn't given him any breakfast. So I went and made him a nice breakfast and, you know, there it is. And I shut the door. But then I heard the little God saying to the big God, will you share your breakfast with us? At least one baked bean. And the big God, he's so selfish, you know, Dad. He wouldn't share anything with them. And he went out into your workshop and he got a sledgehammer and he beat them all up. He's a real thug, bully. And look, there's the evidence. He's still holding it. <laughs> and Terah looked at Abraham with wide eyes. You know, are you mad? <laughs> uh, 
these gods, they can't do that. They can't walk around. They don't speak. They don't eat baked beans and f fried eggs. You know. And Abraham said, exactly. They're just stone and wood. So why do you bow down and worship them? And this, of course, was a big shock for terror. You know, because he was, ch he was you know, challenging the, the ideology or the gods of, the, his, uh, of his day. And Terah was really shocked, you know. He couldn't give an explanation of why he worshipped and bowed down and worshipped these idols. <clears throat> anyway, so Terah said, look, I better take you to visit Nimrod. So Nimrod was the, the local dictator of the town of Ur. It is sort of the archetype of all dictators ever since, till today. Anyway, so Nimrod then, he thought he was a god. <clears throat> and so when Ab do you, do you know the story of William Tell? Yeah. Yeah, so there's William Tell and uh, the governor of the town, I don't know which one it was. And he, you know, he, everyone had to bow down to the governor of the town. Anyway, the governor got a bit bored sitting there waiting to get bowed down to. So he put, his, he put his hat on top of a pole in the middle of the market square and everybody, all the Swiss people who came in, they had to bow down to this hat, which was, I mean, the governors then, they were Austrians, <clears throat> and uh, William Tell. So people would just avoid the market square because they didn't want to bow down to this hat. Hey, William Tell, who came in from the countryside, he just walked across the market square, he didn't bow down to the hat. <clears throat> and so he got arrested, and, you know, that's the story. So Nimrod then was like that. He wanted people to bow down and worship him. He thought he was their god, uh, just like Mussolini did, said the same sort of thing, Stalin. Kim Il Sung, all these kind of dictators, they all see themselves as being gods, and they have these huge statues, <coughs> and they need, you know, they have to offer flowers to these statues and bow down to these statues. Anyway, that's the same thing that's going on with Nimrod. Anyway, so Terah then, he took Abraham to see Nimrod, and Terah bowed down in front of Nimrod, who's sitting on his throne, and Abraham just looked, stood there and looked at him. And Nimrod said to Abraham, why don't you bow down and worship me? I'm your god. And Abraham said, only bow down and worship the invisible God that created the heavens and the earth. And it will stand in judgment upon you for all your wicked deeds. Anyway, this didn't go down very well. So Nimrod had uh, Abraham arrested and thrown into a prison. And then he tried to burn him in a fiery furnace. And um, <clears throat> the, anyway, the angels came along and he wasn't actually burnt. And then at that point, Terah thought, mm, maybe we should move. And so then they became <coughs> political, <coughs> religious <coughs> refugees. And they left Ur and they went to Haran. <coughs> so that's the kind of person Abraham was. And so when, so when Nimrod said to Abraham, I'll put you to death, <coughs> and Abraham said, I'm not afraid of you. God is more real to me than you are. God is more real to me than this palace in which you live. If you kill me, I'll just be with God in the next world. Yeah. So, you know, in that situation, he was willing to risk his life for what he believed to be true. Total commitment to the truth. Totally unwilling to compromise with his conscience with the truth. And you look at people in the Soviet Union, these are dissidents yeah, who are imprisoned for their faith. And you can see some people around like this today. It's like old Ron there standing on the streets in Colchester. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, there are people who are so dedicated and committed to the truth, they were unwilling to compromise no matter how much they are persecuted, no matter how much they get ridiculed, no matter how much they end up going to prison. It hasn't happened, which happens in some countries, happened in Ireland to a... a a teacher in Ireland was put in prison because he refused to use the correct gender terminology to one to students in his in his school. He actually, went to prison. You can see, yeah, you know, same sort of thing going in this direction here. And people have to decide. You know, religious people have to decide: Are we just going to conform to the idols of this age? Are we going to bow down and worship the state? The state says this as redefining the meaning of the words marriage, redefining the words, the pronouns. Are we going to go along with this? Or are we going to stand up for what we know to be true, based upon reality? That there, there are binaries, male and female, positive and negative. That's the way the world is. That's the way God created the world, based upon dual characteristics. 
So when the government says, well, actually, there are no binaries, and some people are non-binary, is that true? Well, no, because every single human being is made up of <coughs> cells. All cells have got within them DNA. DNA is a double helix made up of, what do you call these pairs? Uh, these pairs of... Um, yeah, the chromosome, within the chromosome is DNA, there's these, these uh, I can't remember what they call now, these binary pairs, anyway. It's a double helix. <clears throat> so that's just the nature of reality. This is the way the world really is. And, you know, the question is, okay, oh, we and other religious people, are we going to stand up for that or not? So that's the kind of person Abraham was. He, that, he was just like that. He was willing to argue with everybody. If he thought Nimrod was wrong, he argued with Nimrod. If he thought his dad was wrong, he argued, he argued with his dad. You know, he was desperately pursuing the truth, yeah, and stood upon what he believed to be true, and was unwilling to compromise. And so, when God came along and said this, Abraham felt that's not right, that's not just, that's not fair. Yeah, just like children do, they say that's not fair. They have this inner sense of what is fair. Now, where do they get that from, that sense of justice? Where do they get that sense of what is fair from? We're just born like that. That is God, that's our conscience. We're born with this innate sense of justice and what is fair. <clears throat> and sometimes people are willing to make a stand on that, and sometimes they're just willing to compromise. Okay, it's not fair, but, you know, do I, I don't want to get, I want to keep myself out of trouble. <laughs> etc etc so that Abraham then was different in the sense that he was unwilling to compromise even with God even with God he would not compromise his conscience and so that's why and then he, as I said you know God said to Abraham be bla walk before me and be blameless so God never said to Abraham follow me God never said to anybody follow me God said to Abraham Walk before me. In other words, I'll follow you. You have to, and but be blameless. So be blameless means just follow your conscience. Never do anything that you, is wrong. Just follow your conscience, and you know what step. You know, and take a step. And when you've taken one step, the next step will, will open up and open up. And you have to learn as you're going along how to do things. You shouldn't have a rigid, abstract view of what should go on. You need to. And so you can see all the trials and tribulations Abraham and all these people went through. It wasn't what they wanted or what God wanted, but that, that was their reality they had to deal with, and they had to deal with it uh, creatively and imaginatively, <clears throat> just like Moses and Jesus as well. You know, the world that Jesus was born into wasn't the world that he wanted to be born into, the Roman occupation, but that was just the way things were. So he had to deal with that. You know, we look at Korea that father was born into. It wasn't the way it was supposed to be. It was a Japanese occupation, all the oppression that went on there, and the incredible suffering. So that was the reality that the father was dealing with, which is why he got so involved in politics. You know, he adapted <coughs> to the reality. Yeah, he wasn't. An, he wasn't teaching abstract truths like Buddha sitting under. You know, he was teaching very practical truths, how to deal with reality. And that's all the projects Father initiated were all ones to deal with the reality that he found around him, the world which he found himself in, and trying to leave the world a better place than he found it. So in that sense, Father's always learning. That's why Father, I mean, I could never, you know, I was always amazed, you know, I'm not sure Inga was there, that, you know, Father would, invite people to meetings and he'd listen to report after report after report after report after report from people. It would drive me nuts. But he just listened and he learned because he wanted to learn and to see what's the reality and okay, how can we do something in this current reality? So, you know, he was uh, someone who learned a lot. And I think that's, as I said, you know, I think God is a learning God. And then we also should be learning people, and also we should be a community that learns from, <coughs> you know, <coughs> okay, we did this in the past, did it work? Yes. Okay, let's carry on. We did this in the past, did it work? No. Well, 
why are we carrying on doing the same thing then? <coughs> yeah. <clears throat> you know, we're witnessing. Well, okay, we did a lot of witnessing standing on the street in the past. Did it work? For a brief period, yes, but then it didn't work after that. <coughs> so we need to think, okay, how can we go about it? The world is different now than it was during the 1970s. You know, the issues are different. People are different. We need to present the principle and all these things differently in the way that which makes sense to people living today. <clears throat> can't teach the principle in the same way as we taught it 40 or 50 years ago because the world has changed. <clears throat> people were meeting are different. And we have to change the way in which we're doing things. We have to adapt, we need to learn and do things differently. Anyway, I'm not going to go on anymore. I said I was going to finish a long time ago. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, thank you for that question, Inga. It was a really good question. I hadn't really thought about it before. But anyway, does that make sense? Yeah. That's just the way he was, totally uncompromising. And uh, yeah. Thank you, our dear brother William, for such an interesting uh, message. Yes, um, the God who learns. Now, we got a bit of sharing. Okay, Ron, we give you the chance. Thank you. Come on, let's give him a big hand. Thank you. He said you can dress like a man. Yeah. He said but you've got X, Y, something, something, and a woman has got X, Y, Y, and he said you can't change that. Right. My first point yeah. up there. There you go. She understands it. Come on. You're a good man. Doing my best. Yeah, exactly. Are you doing a video vlog? It's like only two genders. And tell me you're going to win a review you have so much of a life in this world that it has to cut off its genitals. Yeah, but listen, that is a mental disturber. Who are you okay? Who are you to say that a little boy can't be a little girl? Because he's a boy. No! Which one has to do with you stood here going against It doesn't matter what's in between your legs. It does. Sorry, good afternoon. Hope. It's my colleague Lee. Um, basically they've called us down here and we just thought I'd just have a chat with you, see what's going on. Yeah, that's I understand fine, you're that's quite fine. a crowd of people. That's 76 seconds of two hours. And the time I go out there is lunchtime because in Colchester they have a sixth form college and they have 2,000 students. And I'd say most of them come out lunchtime and they come into the high street to get a sandwich, you know, and to get some fresh air. And there I am with my billboards and they stop. What do you think about transgender? And then I explain. And of course you get the few that are angry and they you know, call you this, that and the other. But I was very surprised. A lot of them really want to know. And I had some very good conversations. There was one young lady I remember. We spoke for about 10 minutes and she was really wanting to know about this gender ideology. I don't want to go into it because obviously you can do your own research. But um, yeah, it was very interesting. And it got quite heated towards the end of those two hours. There was about 30 students. And then all of a sudden I saw a, I think they call him a PSPO officer. They walk up and down making sure there's no problems. And he says, you've got to stop, you've got to stop. I fear for your safety. Come on. You know, and so we went off and someone called 999. And then the police arrived. Well, what are you doing then? Huh? And uh, I explained and he checked. He says, well, I... I can't see any hate speech there, so that's fine, you know, no problem. So, um, altogether, a very interesting time. I tried to go there once a week, and um, gradually I hope to expand to other places like Ipswich, come to Ipswich, <laughs> or, or Chelmsford, uh, you know, or Ilford. Yeah, so uh, I just feel it's something that needs to be spoken about. There's a lot of bad stuff happening, you know, and it's all based on believable lies, couched in compassion diversity, equity. It sounds nice, but what they're saying is not true. And so many young people are believing it, and a lot of damage is being done to our children. And as I have several grandchildren, I'm, yeah, I'm concerned what they're going to be listening to when they go to school. Okay, so. 
Try it. It's good. Yes, that's great. Thank you so much. You know, uh, there is this.